So welcome, everyone, to my talk on safety-critical Linux. And to put it a bit more catchy, is the Linux kernel development good enough to make your life depend on it? This is a progress report on the procedures and methods to qualify Linux, the Linux kernel development process. So before we go into the topic, I just want to know what's the background in this audience. So just a few questions. So raise your hand if you have some background in kernel development. Kind of expected. Everyone does. So maybe you can raise your hand if you have some background in functional safety. OK. There are a number of people as well. So who has background in that intersection? Functional safety and kernel development. Yes, so you are the people that we're going to hire to get this done, right? Uh, Darren, in the first row, he knows that it's going to be a difficult task. So let's get started on this question. And the motivation for it comes from the company I'm working for, BMW Car IT, which is the software company affiliated with the car manufacturer BMW. And as you know, in the current industry, the auto man automotive manufacturers are moving towards autonomous driving. And you immediately come up with the question, how are you going to build a system, autonomous driving, in software? And you'll figure out, I need an operating system for that. And can we use, choose Linux to build this in, for autonomous driving? And we asked this question a couple of years ago, and this led to the OSADL Cell to Linux MP project. Its mission is to provide the procedures and methods to qualify Linux on a multi-core embedded platform for safety and category level two, according to IEC 61508 edition two. So if you don't know what safety integrity level two is or IEC 61508, don't worry, we're gonna go into that later on. We want to show that these procedures and methods are not just some kind of toy things that don't work. We want to show that this is feasible to apply them in a real world system. And we want to show that this is, has some potential of reusing the Linux kernel analysis that we're doing in later products as well. So this is a collaborative project of industrial and research partners. Um, its full members are BMW CAR-IT, Intel, Airtech, KUKA, Sensortechnik, Wiedemann. And we have a number of reviewing members as well. We're supported by people from academia, and we have experts from certification bodies that help us interpret the safety standards. And last and most importantly, we have the core working team. That's Nicholas McGuire, Andreas Platzek, Lukas Böhm and Markus Kreidel that are working full-time on this question. So to go into this, to guide you through this talk, we're going to have three sections. First, I'm going to set the scene. What are we talking about? What do you have to know about functional safety and the system that we're assuming? Then we're going to go into a part we're going to talk. So how do you start this safety qualification considering Linux? What are the questions that you have to consider and what are potential methods and answers that you can give. Third part is going to be about assessing the Linux kernel development quality. So finding out is Linux kernel development good and what are the gaps and how can we improve that. So this first part, the Linux safety qualification, is interesting for people who are building products, who are going to build a system using Linux. The second part is interesting for kernel developers to know what kind of things we observe, what kind of things we measure to claim that you're doing a good job. So let's start with functional safety. And as I've seen, probably half of, probably more than half of the audience actually has no background in functional safety. And if you don't know anything about this topic, you just start and look at Wikipedia, and then you can start reading and you see functional safety is the part of the overall safety of the system that depends on the system operating correctly 
in response to its inputs, including the safe management of likely operator errors, hardware failures, and environmental changes. And the objective of functional safety is freedom from unacceptable risk of physical injury or of damage to the health of people, either directly or indirectly. So what does that mean? Put it very simple, the system should work correctly, and it should work correctly if the person does something wrong using it, if some hardware failure occurs, or if you're actually using it in a slightly different environment than you actually intended to use it. And what you have to do is that you have to make sure that the system works correctly and doesn't hurt or kill anyone. So the work on functional safety is not software development, traditional software development, it's actually a risk management activity. And this means that you are gonna try to have a software development process and your task is to find out how to set up the quality assurance in the right aspects and in the right parts of your development. So the definition said we have to show the freedom of unacceptable risk. So who's going to decide which risk is acceptable and which one is not? Is it, is it okay if a, if a um, train crashes every 100 hours? Is it okay if a flight crashes every 1,000 hours? And I say, well, yeah, I can, I can take that risk. And you're going to say, well, I disagree. This is unacceptable. And you find out we have to come to a consensus among a larger group. Actually, you have to come to a consensus among the whole society. And to do that, the process was in the past as follows, that there was an agreement on a global safety standard. So this is IEC 61508. It tells you the, it's a functional safety standard that applies to all different kind of industries and tells you what kind of things should you do to build a safe product. And what you will do is you print out this IEC 61508. You have 10,000 pages of nicely written prose, looks like legal text. And you're gonna go over it, you're gonna sleep with it, and you're gonna find out, if you're gonna summarize it in half a slide, you will say the following things. If I wanna design a safe system, I have to do two things. First of all, you're gonna do a system design and analyze your system. You analyze your system to find out which part must be of high quality and which part must be um, of higher quality than others in that system. For that, you have safety integrity levels, SIL 1 to SIL 4. So SIL 2, as I mentioned before, is kind of medium risk, medium safety level. And then to actually achieve that, to build that with high um, with a rigorous development process, you can actually achieve to build a high quality software. So the safety standard tells you which objective you want to meet um, in each development phase to get a high quality product. So considering the system architecture, now, so we, now that we have some kind of understanding of functional safety, you have to build our system and you have actually different system architectures that you can consider. You want to have some high-performance software running, doing some kind of computation, and then um, invoking something that can actually possibly kill or harm a person. And you have different kind of architectures available for that. You can run the high-performance software on custom-off-the-shelf hardware and have afterwards a safety check that just checks that this output is within reasonable ranges and it cannot hurt anyone. And that safety check is simple, you can implement that, and you're gonna run it on high integrity, high, uh, low performance hardware. A second possibility is that you actually use custom of the shelf hardware, you employ a, a hypervisor, and you're gonna use this hypervisor to isolate a customer market OS with non-safety non critical software and the high performance safety software. What you're gonna find out when you do this design is that the safety software is gonna run without an underlying OS. So if you need scheduling, multi-threading, file system, you're gonna implement all this in your safety software. 
And the third approach that you could take is that you use the Linux kernel to isolate the non-safety critical software and the high performance safety software. So we're going to have to show that the Linux kernel provides sufficient isolation and the safety software can use the scheduling from Linux, the multi-threading, the file system, and so on. The main challenge there is, of course, that parts of the Linux kernel has to be qualified. And that's the, the challenge that we're going to take in the Silto Linux project. So let's get started on that. And if you look into the following notable facts on the Linux kernel development, I'm just going to mention them here, right? We have 23 million lines of code. We have 14,000 commits in every release. There are over 17,000 developers in the total history. You're going to find 1,700 contributors in each release. And of course, there are different kind of companies, or they act as individuals. The development process is highly transparent. The process is actually defined by a social contract, not by any kind of legal working contracts that you see here. And the stabilizing phase is also impressive as well. You're going to see that you ac actually have 90 bugs corrected each week. And that's detected not only by running it on devices, but also by continuously, continuously someone looking at the code, certain vari verification activities that are going on in the community. So this is nothing surprising to you. You're all kernel developers, you know that. If I do the same slide in front of an audience of functional experts, uh, functional safety experts, you're going to have half of them standing up, screaming, and running out. And they have good reasons for that, right? They never have to deal with a code base that large. They never have to deal with so many commits in such a short time. They actually have seen problems when they had two or three companies working together on one artifact. So they're not going to trust that you can do anything if you have more than 10 companies working together. And of course, they're relying on the fact that there are some kind of working contracts in place that you can say, well, someone takes responsibility. But you don't have to worry about those half those people that have all been running around screaming and have left the building by now. The things that the, the persons you have to worry about are the other half that are still sitting there and they're going to start asking really uncomfortable questions to you. And you have to provide reliable answers to those questions. So let's do this. So how can the Linux kernel cause physical injury or damage to the health of people? That's the starting question. And the answer is easy. It depends. It depends on so many things. It depends on environment, system, hardware, the safety application software that you're running. And if you now try to answer that question in a generic way, you're either going to make a large number of system assumptions that are either completely unrealistic or they're not even implementable for that system design that you want to actually build. So what you come up with is that you have to understand and use the system context. And this is what we did in our project. We chose a simple example system to understand the activity that we have to do. And this activity ha then has to be repeated for each and every system. So it's always done for each specific system. And you can't claim, well, Linux was used in this safety critical system. And hence, if I'm just going to employ it here, it's just going to be safe as well. One of the problems when you encounter um, the assessment of the Linux kernel is that it is pre-existing software. This means the software development is already done with a fixed process before you actually build your system. And of course, the kernel developers have no understanding of the specific system context that you're considering when you want to build your system. So there's a solution to that, and that is that you split the activities in the activity in two steps. The one thing is that you have a system-specific activity where you determine which functionality of the Linux kernel I actually use and which has to be assessed. That's specific to your system. The other part is that you look at the development process 
in the Linux kernel development. So was the Linux kernel development done with sufficient rigor? And if you find any kind of gaps, close those gaps with further measures that you have. And in case of an operating system, we have to consider that it has a significant context unspecific functionality. It has a large hardware software interface. And all these functionalities can impact safety. So your main goal is to make the system depend on very few selected OS functionalities. And you can select those OS functionalities based on the artifacts, on the evidences that you, could, that you can gather from the development. For that, we have two methods. Has it driven decomposition, design and development, and assurance-driven selection? So let's go into that. Has it driven decomposition, design and development, so short HD3, um, is a systematic approach to uh, a problem that we had in our um, system analysis. So what we want to do is we want to have precise technical safety requirements on the lower levels on an operating system that clearly indicates which impact it has on the system safety. When we did the first iteration of our safety engineering, we came up with requirements that was of the kind, the syscall open is used in a safety critical application and must work correctly. And the problem with that is, if you look into the specification of open, it has a, a large number of different options, and it's actually way too imprecise, this requirement, to tell you what is the further testing, the verification and validation that I have to do. So we redid our safety engineering, and we used this new approach, a dedicated method that should achieve more precision. Um, and by doing that, we came to the, the conclusion that we could actually have 12 constraints on the syscall open. And now taking these 12 constraints into account, we can do specific testing and verification activities that is feasible within our project. So to explain you this new method in a very high level one slide. Um, so what we did in our naive system safety approach is that we started with the top level system design. We did a hazard analysis and we came to functional safety requirements. We took that and did a functional decomposition until we were at technical safety requirements on the level of an operating system. But at that point, the requirements were way too unclear how they related to this top level hazards. So instead, we started the activity repeating a top level system design and hazard analysis, just as before. But then we unroll the system design by one level and we restart this hazard analysis so that we get refined safety requirements on the next level. And we repeat this process by unrolling the design once by one until we're at the level of having requir precise requirements on the operating system. If you want to know more about this approach, we had a three-day workshop last year, and we're probably going to have another three-day workshop next year going into the details of that. So another method that we found was assurance-driven selection. And I'm going to explain that with a simple example. So you get the, the task to implement an init system that sets up the partition for the application with isolation and controlled access to the shared system resources. And it should start up the safety application in those partitions. So it's just some kind of uh, startup manager. And if you would do this with a functional driven selection, so let's say a traditional system, a software engineering approach, you would look, okay, what are the pre-existing technical solutions out there? You'll find init, you'll find systemd, you'll find other technologies, and you find that using systemd and writing a few systemd service files, you solve the problem. Unfortunately, you now have the task to qualify systemd. And then when you look into that, you'll find out, well, Actually, I can provide evidences that this was developed with high quality. The artifacts that you can gather are not sufficient to claim that. So the so solution to this problem is that you actually take 
the assurance data that you find already in the into the selection process. You, so you consider the technical solutions out there. You can look at init and system D and find out do they what's the potential and the effort to qualify them. And you can also consider doing a simple, simple special purpose dedicated program and qualify that. And if you do that, you'll find out the effort to qualify the special purpose program is much simpler because we don't have the evidences for the other artifacts. And for the, lower, for the small program that we wrote ourselves, we can actually develop that process. So the message here is not reinvent the wheel every time you have to do such a task. The, the answer is really you have to always consider the effort of the qualification when you actually do this kind of selection. And in some, sometimes this means that you actually use a solution that is maybe from a functional point of view, not the optimal one, but from a qualification point of view, is much simpler to handle than the other solution. So we did this, and this resulted in the following software architecture that we're assuming. We have the safety critical and non-safety critical applications running on the same kernel. The isolation between them is achieved with CPU shielding, we use dedicated cores and memory regions for that. And we try to identify unintended behavior of the safety critical applications with SecCompt. The safety critical applications actually use glibc because that's the, the library that we had the most assurance data for. So now we're going to go into the next part and show what we do to find out if the Linux kernel development is done with sufficient quality. And there we developed a number of new methods and tools to do this kind of analysis. There's one part where we do analysis of the kernel get data. So we have the statistical prediction models that sh shall predict how many remaining bugs are in the kernel. And we have other processes, uh, other tools and methods where we try to find out different questions that are asked in the safety standard. Can you tell me what is the competence of the persons involved in your development? Do you know what the dependency between the developers are when they are doing this review? Can you find, the can you find critical patches that didn't go to, through enough review for the, for the level of trust that you actually want to put into that? And we have tools that try to do that. The second step, the second methods and tools go all around analysis of the kernel source code. So we have a database of all the execution traces from syscalls to show that there is a certain independence of different protection layers, that there is a certain path covers of some syscalls and others not, independence of consecutive calls and some inherent diversity of system call executions. I think an interesting tool that I've now already heard from multiple people um, having some kind of prototype of that as well is the patch impact tester. So you want to determine if a patch has actually impact on the specific kernel configuration that you have. And it seems that this is uh, interesting for, for various people in this community. Third tool is a code minimization tool which pre-processes selectively if and if the if defs and if to minimize the source code when you want to do review inspections or pass it to a source code analysis tool that isn't aware of the kernel build system. So I'm going to show you, so I think actually all of these different tools deserve a talk by themselves. They're very interesting, but we don't have time for that. So I'm just going to look into one method that we assessed or that we developed. And I'm going to choose the one that's actually the one that is um, the most difficult to argue one, and the, most, the, the one that actually raises the most discussions within our group. So what you're going to see here is the statistical prediction models to predict the number of remaining kernel bugs. On the left side, we actually just plotted the bug age histogram that we extracted from the 
fixes tag from a 4.4 kernel. And what you see here is that most bugs are actually detected after roughly 500 days. And then if you look at a point around 1,000, 1,500 days, there's a really low, long tail of remaining bugs that are in there. So if this is true, and bugs actually behave in the following way, you would see in a stabilization phase a decreasing number of bugs being fixed, bugs being detected, bugs being fixed. So what we plot here on the right-hand on the, on the right side is the number of bug fix commits that are um, contributed to the 4.4 um, kernels from 4.4 well, 4.41 to 4.477. And you can see that it's kind of a, a random cloud of points. But if you, use it, if you use statistical models and that, you will see that there is actually a decline of the number of bugs in there. So at some point, you can actually say, well, tell me with which confidence do you believe how many remaining bugs are in there? And that gives you a risk estimation how many bugs um, could pot potentially impact your system safety. So I guess if you've seen the last slide and you've been wondering, okay, they just plotted some things and that seems fine, but I have hundreds of counter arguments that could explain that picture as well. And I completely agree, so if you have any kind of discussions on this topic, I'm happy to discuss that after the talk or within the next few days. Um, I really selectively just picked out one part of an argument and probably to all your arguments, counter arguments, we have to come up with a reasoning that explains that your counter argument might explain part of that picture but not the complete picture. So now th that you've seen the methods and tools that we developed and which we apply, I want to tell you a bit how we want to actually improve the Linux kernel. And it starts with a very simple core observation that if you would try to build up an internal team that should improve the Linux kernel, you're probably going to get into the point that you find out that actually the competence of your internal team is probably not going to be as good as taking the overall kernel developers into account. So this means if you're going to modify the Linux kernel with this internal team, you're not following the development process, and that's going to reduce quality and going to increase the risk of safety critical bugs. So if you really want to reduce the risk, and that was our ultimate goal, you actually take a stable mainline kernel. So there's no kernel for, no Linux kernel for safety. It's just a well-matured LTS kernel. And you try your best to improve in this process the artifact that you're constructing. Right? So if you're going to do a change for an improvement, it has to follow the Linux development process. And this means, of course, the improvement must be reviewed, accepted, and appreciated by the kernel developers. And now trying to do that in some engagement or interaction with the ongoing development is, of course, much more effective than trying to do that in some kind of deferred post development mode. Nobody's going to react to you if you're going to say, oh, by the way, you didn't uh, follow the coding style 10 years ago on this patch. Nobody's going to bother about that. If you're going to say that, oh, this was, by the way, yesterday, and we have some, we have some um, risk that this, let's say, this different syntactic structure is going to confuse someone later on, you actually have a good argument that he's going to rewrite your, your, his code. So this kind of involvement has to be collaboratively with the Linux kernel development. So what kind of activities do we see for, the, for use in safety-critical systems? Right, so there's, on the one hand, there's an existing coding style, and what we actually did is we looked at the existing coding style and gathered evidence for its quality. It's more or less gathering conclusions that have been discussed on the mailing list that have led to the decision that the coding style is in such a way and not in such a way. So it has been well argued 
And we just gather the evidences, write a documentation why it has been this way. We try to monitor and motivate its compliance so that we actually can claim people are following that coding style um, rigorously. On the testing side, we want to extend the tests of the Linux test project for the system calls that we determined. We want to apply static analysis methods, so using the uh, kernel testing tools that are already out there and defy, try to find more bug patterns, more bug classes. And last, we want to address the point of change management. So we want to have, we want to monitor and we want to assess if bug fixes from the main line have actually been consequently backported to the LTS versions. And we want to analyze which bugs could actually, or which kernel bugs and which bug fixes could actually impact the system safety. And of course, all these activities will focus on parts of the Linux kernel that are relevant for the system safety. So if we don't use audio, you're probably not going to see any kind of changes of that kind in the audio driver. So I'm just going to pick out one of those activities, and that's the maintenance task that's going to be hunting us the next few years when we're going to use Linux in a safety-critical system. And it's actually quite easy. The safety standard says you're required to do a continuous monitoring and analysis of identified issues. What they mean with that is, of course, you're going to identify issues in your system and if you find out that some part of your software that you developed is wrong, you have to act accordingly. But in case of the Linux kernel development, this also means that if someone else finds a bug in the Linux kernel development, and I've shown you that's about 90 bugs every week in the current 4.9 kernel, you actually have to react to that as well. And how are, going to, how are we going to implement that with the Linux kernel development. So the bugs are actually continuously found in, the, in Linux, and these bug fix commits are backported to the affected LTS branches. And then we actually have to consider that every product developer that uses Linux in a safety critical system must determine if that bug and that bug fix impacts the system that he's running or that he's shipping to his customers. And we do this with a two-step process. So first, you're going to find out that for each bug fix, you're going to have a kernel analysis team that's describing the impact of that kernel bug on user space and its bug fix in the detail that you need. So this analysis is independent of the specific system. And you can actually have a collaborative team of all the product developers working together to find out what's the impact of that bug fix that, we're gonna, uh, that was detected in the kernel development. And the second step is then taking this output and passing it on to a system analysis team for each, t for each system, and they have to judge if that described bug fix has some impact on the system and the system safety. And if it does, you have to probably go through the difficult question of how, how likely is it that this bug fix will actually trigger in my system? Do I switch the functionality off, do a new analysis, find out if I want to apply a software update, apply the software update, and then reactivate the functionality so no, that nobody gets hurt in the meantime? So I'm already at the end of my talk, and I'm just going to conclude with the following words. If I've got you interested with a number of these topics that we are discussing, you should consider uh, joining the safety critical Linux group that we're working in. So if you want to join that group, you can contact Nicholas McGuire, or you can come to me um, after the talk, or write me an email. And we have a number of upcoming events in November and December where you're all invited to come if you're interested. So we have a project management meeting in November in Munich. Uh, there's a course on IEC 61508, so an introduction to functional safety uh, in the mid of November in Graz. And we have a hands-on workshop. We're going to actually try out using the different Linux 
quality assurance methods um, to improve the Linux kernel in a three-day workshop, and hopefully people that are interested continue doing that activity um, later on. So what you've seen in this talk is that if you have a multi-threaded high-performing complex safety applications, you're probably going to need the qualification of a full-fledged operating system. And our project shows that this is feasible with the Linux kernel. And one of the main insights that was part of this project is that the difference between a safety-critical Linux and a mainline Linux is actually only the way you use it. But that's the important part. You have to know how you use it and you have to design your system that you use it in a proper way so that you can actually get this task done. If you're going to do this simplistically, you're going to have a task in front of you that you just cannot um, encounter or that you cannot, just cannot um, get done. So part of that, um, what we've seen is that certain activities can be done collaboratively, although for specific systems, you always have a system-specific activity. The uh, safety-critical Linux group is actually interested in quality assurance activities that is in line with the kernel community, and we're trying to bring together two groups. That's on the one side, product developers that are trying to use Linux in a safety-critical system, and kernel developers that are interested in improving the quality of the Linux kernel development. So if you're any one of those and you have interest in that effort, please contact me or Nicholas McGuire. Yeah, thanks for your attention and I'm happy to answer one or two questions. Let's just start there. Yep. Yes. So the question was, how do we achieve the, actually the partitioning of memory regions on the physical memory? Um, I think it comes together with two things that we use. Sure, you have to have kind of, um, you have to make sure that the hardware doesn't mess this plan up, right, and just randomly rearranges that. That's the one hand. And the other thing is that we use um, the Paloc patch. So that's a, a patch that makes sure that the Linux kernel um, applies, uh, puts the memory in a certain physical memory location. And that's the part that we apply to make sure that we actually have them in separate physical memories. Yes, yeah, so, the, yeah, so right, for DMA, the, the, probably the main question then is um, how do you make sure that this part of the system, that DMA master, doesn't mess this up? Yeah that we have to address as well, yeah. 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 Yeah, so the question was, how do you deal with hardware that hasn't been put mainline? And that, there's, of course, two answers to that. First of all, there's a selection, right? You're going to use the hardware that is mainline. And you're going to have to have hardware that's going through a qualification process anyway, so they're going to have a lot of effort. So the actually effort to getting that mainline is probably not the big step. If you're now going to say, I still want to use that board and it hasn't mainline, hasn't been developed mainline, you have to show that this has sufficient quality. And I guess that's actually much more difficult than just getting it mainline anyway. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, th yeah, so the, the question was, when are going to see the first product with uh, Linux um, using a, a safety-critical system? And the answer is actually quite simple. Um, there is already Linux used in safety-critical products out there. Um, so it's already done. Um, the question is, of course, when do we see results from this project, right? Um, and I would expect that, as you said, something in around five to ten years, you're going to see um, products coming out. Hopefully, uh, a number of them um, working collaboratively and not trying to do that on their own. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you. And if you have any further questions, just come to me after the talk. <laughs>